um, yeah, so just um, if you've got an antidote or something, we're going to talk a little bit about some examples as we go through here. But for the most part, um, where we're starting here is sideways when unfortunate things occur in your business. And um, the main thing I want to say here, and I'm just going to move this so that you can see, okay, down here, um, is... I am incredibly humbled to be teaching, hi, to be teaching this class today because I'm currently in, oh, we've got a couple of people showing up. Hold on, Darren, we're gonna let some hits in. Hi, how you doing? Good. Oops. How's everybody doing? So we've got a couple other folks. Um, I just now started, so I'm just gonna get going. Um, so what I was saying is it's really ironic um, for me to be teaching this class today because I'm currently in the pit of doom right now in a part of a transaction. Um, I obviously can't divulge the details, but suffice to say that um, uh, I haven't had much sleep over the last three days and a lot of upset stomach and just really tears may have been involved. That's all I'm saying. Um, so this trend, this business, um, is very humbling and can teach you a lot about yourself. Um, and if you like to be self-aware enough, um, you can grow around it. <clears throat> I teach a lot. And so, um, the main thing I talk about all the time is when something goes sideways, build a bunker around it. And we're going to talk about that in the end, but it's just really about, um, putting a new system in place so that you can prevent that from happening. Um, next time. So, um, hi. hi Good. Uh, transactions, uh, a lot can go sideways in a transaction. And we're going to talk about um, some of those potential pitfalls and how we can avoid them or just be aware. Um, and then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about the basics of what happens if you have to take next steps. Okay. So, I got to move my little thing here so that I can see everybody. Okay. So the types of issues that I see in transactions that can cause a deal to go sideways, first off is inexperience. Um, second is lack of preparation. This is gonna be on YouTube. Um, uh, uh, Alana is in at Career Visioning on the east side of the state, like five hours away. So she'll put this up tomorrow on the YouTube channel. So if you want notes or whatever, you can write whatever. Okay, so inexperience lack of preparation, miscommunication, errors and omissions, contractual issues, dishonesty and fraud, and the unforeseeables, like just the things that catch you off guard. So the first thing I wanna talk about is just make sure that everybody understands what a fiduciary is. Um, some of us are very close um, to our recent um, licensure and we've studied fiduciary, but believe it or not, some of us that have been doing this a long time forget. And um, the acronym that we use is old car. So um, the O stands for obedience, L for loyalty, D for disclosure, C for confidentiality, A for accounting, meaning numbers and money, not accounting. Are you doing what you're doing? Put that too. Reasonable care and diligence. So with all those in mind, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about sideways. You are a fiduciary either with your seller or your buyer. So the next part of inexperience aside from fiduciary is not understanding the process. The obviously, when you're inexperienced and you're just getting started, you may not understand how the process goes from start to finish. Um, I do teach occasionally, it's been a while, um, a very long class um, that we can talk about if somebody's got interest in it over buyer transactions. Um, I've taught that on a Saturday for like eight hours, um, but we could spread it out over a couple of weeks if you wanted to do that, but not understanding the process. Um, and then like who is involved in that process and what are their roles? So you've got buyers, you've got sellers, you've got lenders, you've got inspectors, you've got appraisers. There's a whole system involved. And what is the flow of the transaction? So that involves, you know, timelines and such, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. The third thing in experience is not knowing your documents. 
So we've got what is the appropriate form to use in this circumstance? How do you properly fill out and execute those documents? And how do the timelines work? I like to add little anecdotes, Mike knows. And um, I had a class with Becky Offit, who is one of the title officers at Elite Closings. And she said one of the biggest problems that they have is that they get orders for new transactions without signatures on the contract. So if you can believe it, it's happened. Um, and that shocks me that people um, you know, are doing that. But she said, yeah, it's, it's for real. So the fourth item under inexperience is speaking on things that you don't know about. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that here, but there's also a component of this in errors and omissions, as well as dishonesty and fraud. So an example of speaking on things you don't know about is to make promises to people, or for example, walking in a house and go, oh yeah, you can take out that wall. Oh yeah, you can put a pool in, or oh yeah, you can put in a fence when you don't know. And so um, we talk a lot in early um, transactions as a new agent to be, be humble enough to say, I'm not sure, let me check on that for you. Trust me, it really goes a long way to covering your backside. Um, just say, I'm not sure, I will check. So the second type of issue after inexperience is lack of preparation. So how to keep the deal on track? That comes with just experience and knowing how to talk to people, how to set up systems to make sure everybody knows what's next, what's coming. And so the deal just stays on track. I can't tell you how many times in the beginning of my career I had transactions I had one like the first year that um, like a week into it, the, the listing agent and I started arguing about what our timelines were. And by the end of that transaction, I set up a system that at the, at the execution of a contract, I send the other side my timelines to say, here's what I see as our timelines. Please tell me now if we're not in alignment on this because we wanna fix that now. So again, building a bunker and putting a system in place. Um, having lack of preparation, um, having trustworthy associates. So, you know, when you're preparing your business, um, and I use the restaurant business all the time uh, as an analogy, you do not just, you know, stand out in the street and say, hey, I'm a restaurant. Woo! You know, you have chefs, you have vendors, you have people that are helping you service your business. So you want to have those trustworthy associates. You're going to be building very tight relationships with lenders. You're going to be building tight associations with title companies and settlement companies. And the third one is inspectors. Like those are my top ones that you're dealing with all the time. And then you've got those ancillary vendors that are like, oh, a plumber here or um, a hardwood floor guy here or, you know, um, a stager or somebody like that. But you want to have people that know how you do business, that you feel confident holding them accountable. And they are likewise um, doing that with you. Um, Third thing in lack of preparation is preparing your clients. You know, this is tough to do when you're new. And again, I'm going to beat a dead horse here and say that it's really advisable to hire a coach, um, be in PC coaching or hire a transactional coach, having somebody guide you along through a lot of the questions and processes. But in preparing clients, I broke that out a little bit. And we're going to talk a little bit about real quick here, preparing buyers. So you want to make sure that they have the proper pre-qualifications. That's in regards to their money and their lender, right? How they're buying the house, um, that they know their timelines, um, they know what not to do. So let's talk about what not to do. Any, uh, does anybody have any examples of what a buyer shouldn't do when they're under contract for buying a house? Go ahead. Shouldn't keep working per se, but. That's one of the, pick, that's the pickle I'm in. It's funny that you said that. <laughs> that's the pickle I'm in right now. Anything else? Not accepting more than one offer. Um, buyers? Um, yeah, you know, you typically would not do that. But let's assume that they're already under contract. What would be something that a buyer shouldn't do when they're under contract for uh, a house? Purchase anything 
Uh, that's a real good one. So don't go buying that's anything something. really big that's going to hit your credit, like like a car or taking out a personal loan for furniture or opening credit cards or anything like that. Anything else? Something stupid like getting yourself fired. Yes, like losing your job. Now you can. There are protections in the in the agreement of sale that protect people that actually do lose their job. But if they've done something to really lose it, lose it, the seller could have some recourse. Um, or if they change a job, because part of their pre-approval process is having job history. And so if you literally completely change to a new company, you now have eliminated that job history and could now jeopardize your ability to get this loan. Um, some other things is um, change of heart. Like they're just like not sure. And that's due to a lack of preparation. You need to be telling them, are you sure? Is this the one? You know, let's go for it and let's hang on. You know, this is going to be a bumpy ride, but I'm here for you, right? Um, let's see um what not to do lender needs so um todd stainbrook here in our office has this really awesome like four page thing that comes with his pre-approvals and years ago i kind of snagged one of those pages because it basically says how are you employed and if you're employed like this this is what you're going to need to make mortgage application if you're employed like this like an independent contractor, you're gonna need this. Or if you're retired, you're gonna need this. And so I share that information with my buyers well in advance while we are looking. So when the time comes, they know what to have ready. I actually advise them to start like a Google Drive or even a folder on their desk at home of pay stubs, um, their tax returns, um, you know, their bank statements and all that so that they can upload it quickly and know exactly what a lender is gonna like. Um, or need rather for making application. So um, realistic inspection expectations, say that three times fast, realistic inspection expectations. So um, that's another pickle that I'm in right now, same client, same buyer, is um, somebody moving here that's not familiar with how old our houses are and what comes with old houses. So you could find asbestos wrap on ductwork. You could find little square tiles that tend to be asbestos tiles. You've got foundation issues, you've got drainage issues, plumbing issues, roofs, all the things. So when you're showing a house, and I call it chit chat when I'm teaching, but when you're showing a house, you know, you're going to be pointing out things like, hey, I just want to make you aware I'm seeing two prong outlets that could, I'm not a home inspector, but that could imply that these are not grounded outlets. Um, these are just things you're looking for um, in terms of electrical panels, or whatever. So you're really kind of building that trust and rapport with the buyer as you're showing the houses you're just kind of helping them be realistic um believe it or not like it's common to have damp ish basements in pittsburgh um people that come here are like oh my gosh it's wet it's like oh, yeah it's pittsburgh um or why is there a toilet in the middle of the basement it's a pittsburgh body you know so those are the things we're we're given our buyers um some things to consider when you're preparing your sellers are they the qualified individual to be talking to them as the seller? Um, I cannot even begin to tell you. I have an agent that I coached for two years and um, she uh, put a buyer under contract. And as the title search was being done, her buyer spent money on inspections, lender appraisal and everything. And then title work came back and said, this person on the dock, the seller is not the authorized person. And so the listing agent didn't do her due diligence and determine whether or not that person was actually the qualified seller and authorized to do so. So if you've had a death or you've had an estate or you're an administrator or you're an LLC or a corp or whatever, you want to see authorization docs. You want to see operating agreements that tell you that Mike can sign for that LLC, or Mike is the fiduciary administrator or trustee as, you know, for that um, estate or whatever. Um, you also want to be having in your listing appointments, you want to be having substantive conversations about the liens that are against the property. 
um, when we teach listing transactions at the listing appointment, like you get down and dirty with people really fast that you've never met before. Like you're learning about their finances. They're telling you about their divorce or child support or whatever. Um, and so you have to be prepared and mature to have that conversation and ask them, what, do you have a loan on this house? Do you have a home equity loan? Do you have a child support, whatever? Are there any other liens or encumbrances that I need to know about this? Um, and that leads us into net sheets. We always wanna do what we call a seller's net sheet. It's one of our required documents and it prepares the seller to know at the purchase price or at the sales price that they're listing at a, a general estimate of all the closing costs, including your admin fee, um, the commissions, possibility of paying for die tests or occupancy and, and those requirements so that they see that bottom line and they know that they're making potentially enough money so to cover all of their other things and they're not upside down. Does that make sense? So um, it's happened to me before, like one day before closing, um, it was a divorce. And during the time that they divorced, the minute the divorce went um, legal with the state, it triggered an ability for a credit card to put a lien on the closing. And the wife had already, the ex-wife had already moved out. And um, there was now a $20,000 credit card bill being tacked on to the settlement of the property, which had been used to wine and dine his girlfriend while he was married. So, you know, you're on the phone with people. And again, talk about sideways, they're in tears and you've got a transaction that could maybe not close. Um, so net sheets are really important in having those conversations about liens. Um, the last thing is just like, I always say it three times, you know how you always say location, location, location. I'm like, disclose, disclose, disclose. There is a timeline after settlement that um, buyers can come back if they feel that a seller was um, dishonest about disclosure and they can prove that. Um, they can, um, you know, get damages and sue, and they can also sue you as a listing agent if they know that you knew about it and didn't disclose it. Um, just a side note, this is why a couple of years ago, the agreement of sale changed and, and required, I you guys might be new, I'm not sure how old you are in the, in the business, but it used to be that when you were under contract and you inspected, you were not required to give the seller side all of your reports unless they asked for them. You could just not give them. Now, how does that affect the general public? Well, if you terminate over inspections and something was found in inspections, it was a big deal. And then you go back on the market and go under contract and you don't disclose what was found. Um, you know, that causes liability for the seller. So now in the contract, it says in any circumstance, after you inspect, all the reports must go to the seller, okay? Oops. So the next one is accountability. So um, communicating with your vendors, making sure that they're staying on track, holding them accountable, keeping a calendar of your timelines so that you yourself are accountable each day, knowing where your timelines are and holding your clients to their tasks. Um, really to me, like if it's a generic deal and it's 10 days to inspect, you've got five days to get the hand money in, seven days to make mortgage application and 10 days to finish your inspections. That is three trains on the track, on the same, you know, going at the same time. So you're talking to them every day. Like, how's it going? Did you get that into the lender? Like I can be annoying, but it's friendly, but you know, the goal is to make sure everybody's doing and what they're doing and you're holding them accountable. Um, the third type of issue after experience and lack of preparation is errors and omissions. Um, and I mean this in terms of like what um, may or may not be covered in the kind of E&O insurance that we carry. If you're not familiar, we carry E&O insurance. You pay for it out of your desk fees here. But um, errors and omissions covers legitimate mistakes that impact the deal. You could make a legitimate clerical mistake, miss a zero, miss a comma, something like that. Um, not delivering on promised services. So if you were unable to deliver on a promise service and you said that we could do this or whatever, there may be some coverage for you there. Um, and indifference or neglect. 
it depends on this. So I want to show you here what's not covered is illegal acts, purposeful wrongdoing. So if you were purposeful in, in neglecting somebody, um, it may not be covered and you personally could be sued from that client or per, uh, bodily injury or property damage. Like this kind of you know, insurance doesn't cover you if you go into a house and break something or um, cause some damage to the property. That's why some properties will have hold harmless if it's like a total dump and it's missing floors and stuff like that. The listing agent may require you to sign a hold harmless when you go in so you're not holding the seller liable. Um, the next type of issue, number four, are contractual issues. And this is where um, I love my job sometimes um, is, uh, you know, having and believing in mastery around your contracts and the agenda that are our lifeblood of our business. So um, huge problems with things going sideways is if you miss a deadline um, that can harm your client, um, you can withhold access to the property, believe it or not, sellers put their houses on the market and then they say, oh, that's not a good time for me for you to inspect. Oh, I'm not available for your, the appraiser to come or whatever. Like there, you need to be setting that preparation early on that they need to provide access to the house for these um, individuals. Inspection issues. So um, that is a contractual issue. You have a contingency for your inspections. So you have due diligence in your timelines to provide that information and a reply to inspection and to negotiate. Um, you can have appraisal issues. Um, we're probably going to be seeing a lot of that, <laughs> um, which we have already, um, is, you know, shortfalls in appraisals. Um, Allie and I attended a um, really nice brunch um, up in Mount Washington with Holland Mortgage, and they had a top top-notch appraiser give like a presentation. And, you know, he talked a lot about like how can sellers help the appraiser you know, to help meet, you know, whatever they're trying to get for the house, um, meaning whatever the buyer is under contract for, they're trying to hit that price. Um, and he said the number one thing you can do is not really providing comps unless you know about an off-market deal that he, that he or she, of the appraiser, I mean, can't see in the MLS. So if you know the next door neighbor sold privately and you've got proof of that, you can share it. But he said the big thing is to show up with um, the uh, list of improvements, any substantial amount of money that your seller has put into improvements on the property, um, show up with a list of that stapled together and hand that over. He also said that it is kind of helpful if you had multiple offers to provide documentation of all of the offers to just kind of give them an idea of what the market is looking like in that area. Um, a way that that would be helpful is appraisers go on vacation. And I had an appraisal one time in Lawrenceville. And this was a few, before COVID when Lawrenceville was really booming. It's still booming now, but it was really crazy. And um, our normal city kind of appraiser that's super um, familiar with the area was on vacation. And this other guy from Zealy <laughs> came in and did an appraisal in Lawrenceville and was not familiar with just like the market value of how that area was um, booming and our appraisal came in so low that it prompted, you know, a reordering, you know, because it just was not, it just didn't make any sense. So um, appraisal issues are a big deal. Um, zoning is probably the hill I will, I will die on because it's on page three of the agreement of sale and agents just put in residential. Oh, it's a trap. Okay. Um, Agents just push, put residential. It's really important to check. Um, I sold a multi-unit in Wilkinsburg and it was zoned commercial. So um, the contract says, you know, that it must be primarily or uh, the majority use of that property be residential for it to be, you know, on that particular contract. So um, always check your zoning. And then another contractual issue is lack of performance. So people disappear and they don't do what they say they're gonna do or what they're required to do contractually. And they think that they can walk out of a closing. Um, they think that they can walk away and keep their hand money or you know, not do things. I've had 
a buyer under contract for a really nice house in Penn Hills, um, and the seller changed their mind like two weeks before closing and just said, oh, hey, you know, we changed our mind. We don't want to sell right now. And they even offered to reimburse the buyers for their expenses or whatever. But in this market, there wasn't a lot of inventory. And so when you rescind or think that you can keep that house, you've now put this buyer in jeopardy of not being able to potentially find a house. And so thankfully, um, the listing agent was super experienced and they have in-house um, attorneys that spoke to the sellers and said, you know, these buyers are serious. They will um, they will pursue this. Um, they want this house. You have to sell. So um, we found a good outlet for that um, by giving them more time to possess so that they could find other housing. Um, but, you know, they were in the same boat. They were wanting my, to put my buyers in. So lack of performance is a big is a big deal sometimes. The fifth type of issue is dishonesty or fraud. So you've got dishonesty and fraud could be incorrect information provided. And that's a pretty wide umbrella that could be providing incorrect um, or false information on a loan application. It could be incorrect information provided telling you that they are actually authorized to sell it. They could forge documents or tell you that they're authorized when they're not. Um, misrepresentation. Again, they could say that they're one person when they're not. I just encourage you if you're listing a house and so-and-so says that's who they are, ask for a driver's license, ask for proof of identity. Um, pressure to act, um, putting pressure on anybody to make a decision. Oh, self, so, you know, you need to take this offer right now. You're not going to get anything better. No. Um, I say all the time when I'm teaching that, um, uh, or when I'm practicing real estate, is your timeline is my timeline. I do not want to rush you into buying this house or buying that house. I want you to feel 100% on, you know, the choices that you're making. Um, Non-disclosure, you know, withholding pertinent information that um, is due to um, agents and their clients, and unrealistic guarantees. Um, you know, if you're trying to pressure somebody into taking house that doesn't have a garage and you're like oh my gosh there's plenty of room here to add a garage like you just cannot do that um, you just need to stay in your lane um the last one is unforeseeables um this one's always fun um believe it or not i've had a lot of these already um death i had a client last year um, go on vacation after we executed a contract and went under contract. He was moving out of state and um, he went on vacation and was killed while he was there. So um, yeah, that, that can happen. <laughs> um, divorce, obviously. Um, I, I just recently had one that closed on a new house and like within a month after they moved into the new house, they sold their other house. And then at the closing, they said, by the way, uh, we've decided to get a divorce and now we need to find another, like, a, you know, it's crazy, but, um, but that definitely happens. Um, a change of heart. We talked about a change of heart before, um, but people can change their minds and you need to be able to talk realistically to them about like what, what ramifications there could be. If they do that, they could be sued, um, they could go to mediation, they could lose their hand money, um, all that. Um, you just wanna be able to advise them the best way that you can. Um, ego is a big one in this industry and I'm gonna tread lightly here, but I'm going to you know, just be really honest. This is a pet peeve of mine. I think it's really important for agents to remember like as a fiduciary, Fiduciary doesn't mean, you know, being a jerk and, um, and causing unnecessary stress um, between agents or between your clients. So the phrase I often use is you are a conduit of information. So if you're my buyer and, or, and you're like, or you're my seller and you're like, no, I'm not going, you know, can you ask the buyer if they would, you know, do these things? Um, and I go to the other agent and I say, hey, you know, my client would like to know if your client could do this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, why would you ask that? That's so dumb. You know, and I'm like, okay, is that your opinion? 
or is that your client's opinion? You know, take it out of the equation and realize that what we bring to the table comes back, you know, to us in our reputations and how, um, how we're building our business. And we talk all the time in coaching about working smarter and not harder. Um, it just causes animosity between people and it just really isn't necessary. So if you, I mean, you want to be forceful sometimes when you're negotiating or you're holding the line, if you will, maybe on, in, on repairs or something like that. It doesn't require being nasty or like, oh, why are you doing that? You know, that's dumb. Or why would you, that's unrealistic, blah, blah, blah. No, just present it and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, uh, home damage. So houses can flood. They can, pipes can burst. Talk to Allie about that. <laughs> um, uh, um, houses can catch on fire. Um, the contract protects the buyer in that regard that the house must be in the condition in which um, it was seen and inspected. And that's how it needs to be, you know, when they do their final walkthrough and they take possession. So any kind of home damage, you know, needs to be acknowledged and dealt with. Um, title defects. Um, I was talking about this recently. Um, I had a condo like townhouse over in Lawrenceville that um, we had bought like two years prior and they were going to sell it. And thankfully they had gotten title insurance when they bought. And this is why I'm always telling my buyers, get title, get additional owner's title insurance. Um, because in the time that they bought it and the title search was done, right? People, it's a real person, an abstractor goes downtown and, and does title search. All that was happening the previous owner, you know, that they were buying from had a contractor that they didn't pay. And so you had this search going on and a lien coming in at the same time. And the search missed the lien and the lien hit the property after the search was done. And two years later, we go to sell and title is doing their work for the new buyer. And they're like, oh, there's a contractor lien on this house. And we're like, what? Um, and thankfully it wasn't a ton, but the title policy covered it. So it's really important um, if you don't know what that is, if you don't, if you aren't able to speak coherently and knowledgeably about what, you know, what that, why that's important, I highly encourage you to talk to somebody at like Elite is my go-to settlement company and Becky Offit is just like, ooh, top-notch type A, you know, title officer and she will talk to your client for you and she will really explain it. Anybody there will. Well, they're a great company. So um, title defects. Um, I've had some crazy unforeseeables with out-of-town clients. So I had a buyer that was moving here from California. They made mortgage application and everything. And um, she put her IDs in a safe and on a moving truck before we signed the documents. And she didn't have any, she couldn't get a driver's license that day. She was still in California. It requires more time or whatever. And it caused like major delays for everybody. So I built a bunker around that. And in my timelines, when I send them at the beginning of a contract at the bottom, I'm like, here's what not to do. You know, you're moving and you're whatever. If I've got a client that's moving, I tell them, get an orange envelope right now and put those IDs, put those important papers and keep it you know, with you as you're traveling or whatever. So you've got what you need. Also the time that it needs for out of town buyers and sellers to get their documents and properly execute them and get them back here in time for a timely closing is really important. Um, I'll share just one uh, a piece of advice in that regard is I always tell people if they're signing out of town, try to do it at least two days prior to closing so that the documents can be scanned before they mail them, scan them over to the closing company so that closing can proof them and then tell them it's good to go. And now they've got a, a, a copy, right? Not the originals, but they've at least got a copy. Then you put it in the mail and overnight it back to settlement. And then those are your wet signatures. But in the meantime, you've gotten authorization that everything's proofed and good to go. And you've got a physical copy because the mail, right? Things can be lost. Um, and then wire fraud. So I'm sharing all my little tidbits here, but that did happen to me actually very close, but not fully wire fraud. But um, I always tell my clients to be careful when they're wiring funds that wire fraud is very real and you could push a button 
and wire those funds to the incorrect place and your money is gone. It will never be seen again. And um, I had an elderly client, she was so sweet. And uh, we talked about it that day. And I said, only take wiring instructions over the phone verbally from this company called this number. And um, before you wire it, call them again and say, I'm here, I just wanna authorize you know, or um, clarify that this is going to the right place. So the next morning I get a forwarded email from her and she said, hey, is this correct? Because it doesn't seem like what you told me would be the process. And sure enough, it was an email that looked exactly like the settlement company. The email signature was the exact settlement company's email signature, but up at the top, the email address was not my settlement company's email address. It was not her. And so it had the exact to the penny funds to close. So the only way they would have known that is if they were inside of a bank and were able to get that information or inside of the settlement company and had tried to get that information. So, um, you know, a lot of companies, lenders and settlement will now send you encrypted final numbers or encrypted um, wiring instructions, something like that, that it's super important to be aware. And I was so thankful that I had that conversation with her because it was like $25,000. Um, and that could, that could, that's it. That can end, that can end everything. <laughs> that's a pretty big unforeseeable. Um, prevention. So again, I'll, you know, um, creating the third one here is creating systems around your transactions. Again, I just really encourage coaching because they can get you up to speed really quickly about what kind of systems you're building around your transactions, but contact your broker and TL for advice, team leader for advice. If you have any concern about something that's happening, always trust your gut. If something's feeling a little off, you know, get advice from someone that you trust, um, so that you can you know navigate that i think it's really important early on in your career to do that for sure because you're not sure you're not sure if that sounds sketchy or whatever but um you know um, building those systems and communicating with people and trusting yourself so um unfortunately i've had both of these actually happen um, in the last year um, hopefully that's the end of that, but we've got mediation and civil action. I want to remind everybody that mediation is already built into the agreement of sale. So technically, and I was told this in a class recently by an attorney that, um, that uh, used to be an attorney for PAR, that mediation isn't required. You can go straight to civil, like filing with the magistrate, but um, I was told by the par legal hotline that mediation like um, judges and magistrates are wanting you to try mediation first to get all that riffraff off their dockets right they want you to try mediation so um, in mediation the first thing you're going to want to do obviously is you're in advance you're talking to your broker and to and letting them know um, that you're you know in some muck right you know something's going down you want to contact your local realtor association and obtain a mediation request form, okay? File, have your client file the form along with the fee. As of April, the fee was $200 each side. So buyer pays 200, seller pays 200. But when you're in mediation, chances are only one side is prompting this okay so the way that this works and there's one mediation company here and his name is actually burn bernard barrand but um you they've got the form at ramp or whoever you're using it's the same kind of form you fill it out and you mail the form along with the check with the 200 dollars fee on the form it asks like who the other side is so then the mediator is going to do his due diligence find the other side and notify them if they say okay yeah we'll mediate they send in their fee and their form with their side of the story and then bernie schedules you know a meeting of the mind so to speak and sees like how can we work through this can we come to an agreement for restitution or not if one side refuses to mediate um, and this is what the par legal hotline told me to do um, is file mediation and then if the other side refuses to show up 
then the mediator will provide a refund of your fee and a letter saying that the other side refused mediation. Um, the PAR uh, legal hotline guy told me too that that really bodes well for your client. If they've shown up and tried to do that and the other side no shows, it doesn't look good on them if then you turn around and file in a local magistrate's office. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, again, um, the fee is refunded and you just immediately then can go to civil action. So again, if you're, if you're jumping over the mediation, you're still notifying your broker and team leader. Um, you want to advise, I should have put this on mediation too, um, and I will fix that, but um, you should always advise to your client that they should consult with an attorney on the legal um, recourse of where their um, complaint stands and get advice there because we are not attorneys. Um, I typically will then Google like the ward or magistrate or, you know, who's in that municipality or if it's Pittsburgh, I look at like ward 14 or 24 and fine because they all have their own local magistrates. Some have two, but usually there's one. There is a civil form that you fill out for civil complaints underneath a certain dollar amount. File the form and the fee with the local magistrate. Your client is doing this, right? We're not doing this. Um, your client will then hear um, from the court on a hearing date. Stay in touch with your client and provide as much support and documentation. I cannot encourage you or in, um, what is the word I'm thinking? impress upon you <laughs> um, that when you know something's going sideways, start taking notes. Start saving screenshots of your text threads save your emails, create a folder, put everything together. And really, because you may not have a court date for three, six, nine months, and you're like, oh crap, what happened? I forget. And you'll forget a lot of the details. So I've gone back and did timestamp things and th this conversation happened and taken notes and whatever. So as much that you can put together for your client to support, to provide support for them. Um, and that means too, showing up at court. Um, I uh, went to um, uh, local magistrates with a seller of mine and sat with him, you know, just to provide support. Um, he decided to represent himself or whatever. And so, you know, I just wanted to be there for him to also be able to answer some questions because sometimes your client doesn't know what happened behind the scenes in terms of conversations or your notes. So um, it's good to just be there for them. Um, and also at the end, I do put advise that an attorney is at the hearing. You know, there's certain protocols, right? Only attorneys know who can talk and who can't talk and um, how to present your case. And so it works to your advantage to have representation. Does I kind of zip? I'm a fast talker this time. Does anybody have any questions? I, this is obviously just scratching the surface, but um, I just wanted to... Um, provide as much data as I could on ways to kind of keep yourself out of hot water. Yeah. Um, so my buyer, they, they are, we're under contract and they have gone to see the house multiple times. Of course, you know, we've been having some heavy rains and stuff. So they go back um, a few days ago and they're like, hmm, the basement is like, some leaking. So they're like, mm, I don't know if we really want this house anymore. So I'm like, Ugh. and I call Allie, you know, and I tell her, but she doesn't, no, I asked her a question about the hand money, mm -hmm. about backing out or whatever. She mm -hmm. said that they would lose their hand money most yeah. likely if they do. Yeah. Uh, but like, what else could I do? Like, you could potentially, and I'm not your broker, but you could potentially, you know, have a case around disclosure. If somebody, if you actually had full disclosures, if it doesn't say in the disclosure that there was leaking ever in the house, but it's pretty obvious that that didn't just magically appear this last week, um, you could say, hey, look, we had dry days and it looked fine, but the seller disclosure doesn't say anything about the basement getting wet you know, they're having second thoughts, you know, um, I would just approach the listing agent with kindness and professionalism and just say, you know, what can we do about this? Like, this is a concern. 
Um, I don't want my clients to lose their hand money, nor should they buy a house that's got a wet basement that wasn't disclosed. So, you know, I do think that there's a case there could be for disclosure if they lost their hand money um, or they could terminate and request, still request the hand money. The seller can say no, but then you can file for mediation and just say, look, we had every intention of following through with this. My other question is like, are they just going over to the house because um, it rained or why are they back no, and forth to so the house? there's actually um, some work that needed to be done. Okay prior to like FHA inspection. So, uh -huh. so he was supposed to be um, painting anywhere that was like chip paint or something. Mm -hmm. um, and something else with the uh, back porch um, that needed to be covered or whatever. So uh -huh. they could possibly pass an inspection and put it on. Uh -huh. So I guess while they're over there, they're like, hey, something's going on. Yeah. The basement's wet. It wasn't like that a few days ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, I don't really want to really wanna do this. Yeah. yeah. I would just be really honest. There've been times I can't say that I've had that per se, but I've gone to do a pre-settlement walkthrough and the basement suddenly got like a river runs through it. Like it rained the day before. And I just counsel agents to have the courage to put the closing on hold and be willing to take whatever lumps come in that way. If your buyer is truly, truly like, what the heck is going on here? I say, do you want to move forward with this purchase? And they're, they're like, I don't know. It's hard to do because you've got timelines and you've got people counting on it. Somebody's moved or whatever. But in the end, your fiduciary responsibility is to that buyer and to protect them. So you want to file an extension, you want to make sure whatever, or put something in writing to just kind of notify the other side that you have concerns about this and why wasn't it disclosed? Like, don't come at them like, hey, you know, like you're still trying to make lemonade, right? <laughs> on a lemon, am I right? Anyway, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so where in the process is the FHA inspection? Do you have to prepare a report sometimes? Um, sometimes, and I think the, the term she's meaning is appraisal. Okay. So there's not an FHA inspection, but if you know that there's going to be issues in an FHA appraisal, you can know you can see those in advance. Oh, there's peeling paint, or oh, we have a missing handrail, or oh, we need uh, smoke detectors or GFCI outlets, all those things. Um, you know, you can be like, yeah, we, if you're representing the seller, you can be like, hey, seller, you just got an offer, a really good offer from an FHA buyer. Buyer, but I'm telling you right now, these are some things you're going to have to fix. Or the seller can say, um, I'm not going to want to fix those. I'll take you FHA buyer, but you come fix those. That's not my problem. You know, you've got the FHA loan, you want to put less down or whatever, you come fix those things. So it is really better to be proactive and try to fix those things. The problem is, is a buyer could go fix those and guess what? The buyer didn't own the house yet. Right? So the buyer's spending money on those fixes. You want to be having a conversation with your buyer and say, this is risky. You haven't closed on this house. If you're making these repairs, you're not, you may not close on this. You may not get reimbursed. Put that in writing. Buyer is willing to do FHA repairs and assumes financial risk in doing so if the house doesn't settle, doesn't close, right? So you're just following the bouncing ball of how to protect your client, but also, you know, how to protect the seller so everybody's kind of in alignment. Um, it's good to do those things because FHA appraisers are notoriously behind and it takes longer to do. So once they come to the house, if those things are fixed, they can just sign off of it and go. But if they come and they see things, then they leave and then you got to fix it. Then you got to schedule them to come back. So it's just a time consuming process. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Books online. Your as -is buyers. Anybody? Do you want to talk about your as-is buyers or as-is Oh, God. I should have put that in sideways, too, so, or in the um, unforeseeables. So I don't know about you guys, but I see a lot of properties that are advertised in the MLS that say being sold as-is. To you and I, as-is can be completely different things. Um, as is for a HUD home or a foreclosed home or a bank owned or a corporate owned property can mean they're not doing any repairs, but if you inspect and inspections are allowed, you can come back and say, hey, this is wrong. We want a credit, you know, seller assist, or we want to, a price reduction. As is, 
for a listing that I had recently was like the house in the in the condition that you saw it and made the offer is the house you're getting. That includes the garbage in the fridge. It includes the this, that, and the other, right? So as is um, can mean different things to different people. And having it advertised, in my opinion, because I've been through this. So what do we do? We build a bunker, right? We put a system in place. I had it as is in the MLS. My uh, seller went under contract. We made it all the way to um, the closing date. The, the buyer had waived all inspections, but he walked into the house. They did their final walkthrough and the closing at the house. He walked into the house and he's like, why is this stuff still in the refrigerator? Why is this, why is this stuff in the basement? There was just a little bit. When I say it wasn't a ton of stuff, like I went over there and filled two trash bags like that. Like, I mean, like whole foods paper bags, not hefty bags. And, um, and they, uh, the buyer said, I'm not buying this house. And he walked out the listing or the buyer's agent didn't file an extension, which meant that we went out of contract and we're currently in dispute over who gets to keep the hand money because it's my assertion it's my assertion that it was advertised as as is um and this, then the buyer waived all inspections they don't then get to inspect right the pre-settlement walkthrough is an inspection they can do it but the, to walk away you don't get to do that so now if i have a house being sold as is i ask the buyer's agent to put it in the contract buyer acknowledges that they walk they personally walked through the house on such and such a date and they accept the property in its current condition now 30 days later i went to go get the lockbox and the grass is up to here was that the condition when he saw it no but i called her and i said i'm here i feel terrible the grass is really tall and it wasn't like that obviously she's like don't worry about it he's fine but that's still just communicating like you don't want to get to the closing table and him cross his arms and say, I'm not closing until you cut that grass. Would he be, would he be able to walk away or in that situation? It's not situation? good. Like that would just be ridiculous. Right, but have right. there been cookie people that are just, you know, not agreeable, that'd be like, no, it, the grass was ground down to the ground when I saw it, right, I expected right. it to be in that condition. Yeah, sure, sure. That's great. It's crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. Anybody, yeah, go ahead. So my buyer, they actually, like, yeah, I think you should have told me that first because that kind of, yeah, it could still be an issue of disclosure because the offer that we make on the house is based on disclosure. So if they had said that the basement leaks sometimes during heavy rain, then the offer your buyers made might have been a little bit different if they knew that, or if it had been disclosed, they might not have chosen that house to put an offer on. So even though they waive inspections, it could still be a matter of disclosure, but Allie's right. I think, you know, your hand money's in jeopardy, um, but there's still the possibility of disclosure case, I think, maybe. No, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Anybody online? Come on, Jayla. Where are you at? <laughs> She's driving. Y'all don't have any questions? I hope I covered enough. <laughs> okay, well then we are at 224. We're finished up about six minutes early. Um, I'm gonna be teaching this again this evening. Um, I, whether or not you wanna listen to my long winded self, that's up to you, but um, we can go over this again. I'm also happy, um, I should have put here in my um, uh, PowerPoint, my email address. So if you want a copy of my outline, I'm happy to send this to you. But my email is Jennifer Sells Pittsburgh. Jennifer Sells Pittsburgh at Gmail. Um, just send me, just says request and it says send me your sideways outline. I'm happy to send you just my notes on this um, so that you can just kind of read through them yourself. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Well, thanks everybody. I really do appreciate y'all coming. Thank you. All right. You. See y'all later. All right. See ya. Bye.